examine the importance of acknowledging collaboration to writing feminist histories of architecture. And in my last lecture, I addressed the importance of recognizing the role that commercial commissions had in providing individual women designers and architects with opportunities for personal liberation. Today, I want to consider the way that working abroad outside one's natal culture empowered two of what are now the most highly regarded women architects of the immediate post-war decades. Jane Drew, born in England in 1911, worked often in partnership with her husband, Maxwell Fry, in West Africa and in India. She's at the top here, and, uh, uh, as well as in Britain. With her husband, Pietro Maria Bardi, Lena Bobardi, who you see at the bottom, left her native Italy in 1946 for Brazil. And she was just a few years younger uh, than, um, I think she's born, I should remember the day, I think 1916 or something. Uh, she's in her 30s already when she leaves in, in, for Brazil. Both women married older, well-established men, with whom they didn't always get on. These relationships certainly helped launch them, but it was working, I would say, in cultures where racial and cultural difference bestowed privilege that outweighed gender that probably made the biggest difference to their careers. Both women furthermore belonged to the second generation of modernists who, too young to have been among the pioneers, remained committed to abstract form even as they adjusted it to fit cultural and climatic conditions in the global south, very different from the industrial Europe and the United States for which these forms were originally developed. Jane Drew was educated, uh, wait a minute, I thought I moved that off. Um, uh, what do I do, forward? Uh, stuck, oops, no, no, it's not too far, there we are. Jane Drew was educated at the Architectural Association in London, one of the handful of architecture schools which can rival UCD's track record in producing outstanding women architects. She married Fry, her second husband, in 1942. Uh, he had briefly uh, partnered with Walter Gropius when Gropius was in Britain between his time in Germany and his move to Harvard. And uh, during World War II, Fry was stationed after he married Drew in what was then the British colony of the Gold Coast and is today Ghana, where Drew eventually joined him. The experience exposed them both to the challenges of what came to be called in the UK tropical architecture, that is inexpensive buildings erected out of modern materials, above all reinforced concrete, that were considered suitable to the much hotter, in forms that were considered suitable to the much hotter and wetter climates of what was then uh, the British Empire in Asia and Africa, although India, of course, already independent in 1947. Now, I'm not going to wrestle today too much with the uh, issue of who designed what in the partnership, although we know that Drew was the one who spent much more time on the ground in Chandigarh in India. In Ghana, the pair built a number of schools, many of them specifically for girls. And here you see a Methodist boarding school called Wesley School for Girls uh, in Cape Coast, a city in uh, Ghana. The arrangement here is still symmetrical and thus somewhat reminiscent of classicism, but there is no imported ornament. In this context, modernism broke as free from the European as uh, from excuse me from the African as from the European past. But the external corridors and pierced screens were intended to facilitate the movement of cooled air in the absence of air conditioning, which was at this time still far too expensive. And when you look at this picture with the columns, it may remind you even of what Edward Durrell Stone will do at the American Embassy in India, in Delhi, about 10 years later. Uh, clearly, he's well aware of this work, uh, both from a formal perspective and from the perspective of climate. Uh, the school, I might add, remains one of the country's most renowned, uh, if not one of the continent's most renowned and has educated a who's who of pioneering women, including the first female pilot in an African Air Force, the first female director of the African Development Bank, 
and the first female Chief Justice of Ghana. So we're talking here about an elite institution, but one that is certainly involved in empowering women of African uh, backgrounds, and not built for the children of colonial officials. Adesado College, despite the presence of the young girl in this drawing, is a comparably prestigious Anglican school for boys in the same city. The perforated screens Fry and Drew designed for commissions like this became a staple of tropical design. Here they loosely referred, loosely, to African art, which the pair admired, but they proved transferable to different cultural, if similar, climatic conditions in newly independent India. Their experience in the Gold Coast led to their involvement alongside Le Cabousier, who Jane Drew recruited for the project, in the design of the new city of Chandigarh in India. Corb was responsible for the urban plan and for the city's most important civic buildings clustered at its northern end. Drew, who spent much more time in India than Fry or Corb, led in the development of housing and shopping in the first sectors to be completed, working very closely with Corb's cousin, Pierre Jean Array, as well as in providing civic infrastructure, such as schools. Note the importance of women as construction labor in India, which can be traced back, as I mentioned in my first lecture, for centuries. Although the Indian team working with Drew included very few women in the architecture level, today architecture is a very popular profession for women in India. I think it's about 60% female. And a number of these women, including perhaps most notably Brinda Samaya, have worked hard to improve working conditions and opportunities for advancement for the women who uh, build their designs as construction labor. Chandigarh, as many of you already know, is the showcase for an independent India, built to provide the now partitioned state of Punjab with a replacement for the historic capital city of Lahore, which had been design, uh, assigned to Pakistan. Traces of colonialism remain prominent, such as the creation of distinct housing types for different income groups. The city, one of several new state capitals erected in the early years of independence, Gadahinagar and Gujarat and Bhubaneswar in Orissa are two of the others, has from an Indian perspective been a success. Although it is now a federal territory serving two different states, after the Indian half of Punjab was again divided between uh, after a Sikh calls of independence, uh, or at least autonomy. Today, Chandigarh is one of the most prosperous cities of its size in the country, and along with Hyderabad and Pune, a less expensive and less crowded alternative to Bangalore as a tech hub. Chandigarh cemented the post-war association between modern architecture and anti-colonialism, but as Mark Crinson has demonstrated, British, and for that matter also French and Belgian colonial officials were at least as quick to adopt modern architecture as newly independent states. Fry and Drew were not always popular with colonial administrators, but they retained a talent for getting work in West Africa in particular. The most important of their commissions there was certainly the one you see here, probably more Drew than Fry, the University of Ibadan, the first university in sub-Saharan Africa intended to serve a largely black student body as opposed, in other words, to the older uh, universities in South Africa, which under apartheid uh, were very much only for whites. Here, as I said, Fry was probably more active than Drew. The reverse is true in India. Both partners also spent considerable time in London, where Dennis Lasden was briefly the third partner in the firm. The firm was not, our African work was not limited to educational and civic projects. Drew designed this headquarters for British Petroleum, BP. Her trip to Lagos for its opening coincided with the granting of independence to Nigeria, which she clearly welcomed, even while she was working for what were clearly British business interests. Note the difference between this building and the glazed towers associated with the international style in the United States and Europe during these years. Think, for instance, of uh, the Seagram building, which is uh, only a year or two older, or Lever House, which is a couple of years older. Steel was a much more expensive material than reinforced concrete, even as it required less labor uh, to build. 
and concrete have been widely used across the empire since the early years of the 20th century. Glass facades were also impractical in hot climates, especially when the air electricity supply was not yet steady or cheap enough to fuel reliable air conditioning. In its relatively modest design and height, both of which nonetheless indicated a strong commitment to international modernism, this building is instead typical of the understated modernism that filled cities in the global south from the 1940s through the 1960s. By the 1980s, many, especially in the global north, would come to see the adoption of modern architecture in the global south as a colonial imposition that crowded out indigenous tradition. At the time, and even later, the cultural elite in the former colonies appreciated and continued to cherish an architecture that brought them to the forefront of the global discussion of modern architecture. Such buildings indicated the possibility of technological and economic progress. This, although it was not always realized as quickly and completely as one would like, was widely understood to be impossible to fulfill solely with recourse to the pre-modern and pre-industrial paradigms of these places. These had been so badly damaged by colonialism that the potential to create their entirely own modernism in these places was seriously impaired. Importing and transforming European models was an effective substitute means of expressing that these places were not to be trapped in their own pre-industrial past any more than the West or North, however you want to think of it, had been. Jane Drew was not an autonomous genius like Le Corbusier, with whom she worked so effectively, but neither was she ever subsumed by her husband's success. People always were very aware of her contribution to the partnership, She's never falling by the wayside in, in terms of recognition. She, uh, partly because she was much more adept at self-publicity than her husband was. She was always uh, and always recognized as being her own woman. She achieved a level of professional success that no female architect in Britain had previously been accorded. And this very much paved the way for Alison Smithson and Zaha Hadid, as well as beyond. Drew also, and in fact, the prize for women architects, which Grafton, for instance, have won, is the Jane Drew Prize. Drew also built in Britain, including for the Festival of Britain, but her work abroad was arguably more original and certainly more influential. In collaboration with Fry, who participated in developing the forms for which they are both known, and with Le Corbusier, the association that ensured that the world paid attention, she was one of the pioneers of tropical architecture, a late British colonial approach to international modernism that was often more experimental and more culturally sensitive during the 1940s and 50s than much of what was being built at home, where a more timid uh, a Scandinavian influenced uh, modernism was often popular. Drew's own politics were progressive, but she benefited enormously from the unequal power differential in which, as in this photograph, race trumped gender. She was clearly aware of this herself, and many warm reminiscences of the last decades of her life speak of the very uh, uh, effusive welcome she gave to Africans and Indians, some of the graduates of schools and colleges she had designed when they turned up in London for further study. She, her, it was often the first place to go, get to, go to Jane Drew to help you get sorted. Outliving her husband by nine years, she died in 1996 at the age of 85. Pretty good run considering how, much, how many photographs of her show her cigarette in hand, <laughs> which is also the case for Lena Bobardi, who did not have one of these really long um, lifespans. She made it into her 70s. Born in 1914, oh, there's the date I was looking for earlier, so they're only three years apart. Um, she moved, at, she married in 1946, Pietro Bardi, and moved to Brazil at the age of 32. Her achievements there attracted little international attention until after her death in 1992, but by the end of the century, she was well on her way to becoming the cult figure she re remains today. Her present fame, as well as the degree to which she was ignored outside of Brazil during her lifetime, both, oh, paradoxically, 
an enormous amount to her marriage. Pietro Bardi was a prominent fascist, <coughs> as well as an equally committed supporter of modernism. He and his new wife, who had, like many Italian intellectuals of her generation, she was younger, become a communist sympathizer during the war, left Italy behind for Brazil because there appeared to be little room in Rome for someone so closely identified as he was with Mussolini. In Brazil, which had just emerged out of a dictatorship under Cotulia Vargas, who would be democratically elected president in 1951, so not nearly as unpopular as Mussolini had been by the time he was executed, Bardi would be able to start anew as the founding director of the Museum of Art of Sao Paulo, known as MASP. He would be a major figure in the Brazilian, uh, post-war Brazilian art world, which is now recognized as one of the world's most dynamic in the 1950s and 60s, prefiguring in particular many aspects of minimalism and performance art long before they turn up in New York. Barty's privileged position as the nexus of the richly intertwined relationship between Brazilian, European, and although to a much lesser degree North American contemporary art, would also be crucial to creating opportunities to showcase his wife's talent. In Brazil, Lina Bobardi addressed many of the differences in climate and culture that Drew had faced in India and West Africa. She began by building a house for herself and her husband in the suburbs of Sao Paulo that would announce their arrival. Modern Brazilian architecture, particularly that of Le Corbusier's disciple, Oscar Niemeyer, who would begin work on Brasilia in less than a decade, was already world-renowned. So simply building in a modern style was not new in Brazil, which boasted one of the most innovative and influential architecture cultures in the world in the 1940s and 50s. Instead, what is new here is the distance that Bobardi was willing to travel from the Corbusier paradigm as inflected by this time by surrealism's curves. Clearly aware of Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and Philip Johnson, although not slavishly imitating either the Farnsworth or that other glass house, she perched her house much higher up, above, even, uh, above far less even terrain. Here you see the way as well in which she, in which as she had always intended, almost jungle-like greenery, very similar to what had to be cleared to build the house, grew up around, around it. Uh, and the way in which indigenous plants changed the character of this place from the North American uh, glass houses of the period, leaving the house and its inhabitants considerably less exposed than they originally had been. Two views of Bobardi in the house emphasize her connection to it. It is very difficult to imagine the body of a male architect playing such a role in the way in which his work is represented. The only uh, equivalent photograph I know of is a very famous photograph of the Villa Maria by Eno and Alvar Alto showing Eno Alto and the patron, Mary Bulichin, who paid for it in the house. And that's a photo from the 1930s. Slim Bobardi is shown dressed informally in slacks. Uh, today, probably all the women in the room except me are in slacks, but in the 1950s, this was an informal statement, uh, looking more like Catherine Hepburn than a more conventionally glamorous figure, but not resolutely professional either. An examination of the section through the house reveals that the glass volume on stilts comprises just part of the building. Behind it are more private bedrooms, and across a small courtyard is a service block containing the kitchen and the maid's quarters. In Brazil, there was no expectation that Bobardi, who had grown up in not particularly wealthy circumstances in Italy, would ever have to cook or clean. Drew had two children by her first marriage before she met Fry, and caring for them while supporting herself was clearly a challenge, but Bardi, while remaining childless, clearly benefited from Brazil's extremely unequal society, even as in later years she would seek to address its social divides in her work. Over the years, not only did vegetation begin to engulf the house, but also the living room became increasingly cluttered with the objects, with objects that did not necessarily conform to modernism's austere rejection of historicism. Of course, the space presented an appropriate blank background for the kind of collection increasingly popular 
among the cognoscenti of the period. Charles and Ray Eames's case study house in California proved si equally suitable to similar exhibits, while jo Joseph and Annie Albers of Bauhaus fame focused on, excuse me, focused on collecting pre-Columban artifacts from Brazil, and, uh, excuse me, from Mexico and Peru following their arrival in 1933 in the United States. At the same time, it is important to acknowledge the huge aesthetic gap between the living room and the kitchen at the service wing at the rear. The kitchen was clearly a luxurious space for the time and place, but there is none of the engagement here with an avant-garde aesthetic that we find in the living room. This is a workspace, and a workspace for somebody other than the owners of the house. Under the direction of Pietro Bardi, the Museum of, Sao, of Art of Sao Paulo, MASP, became the leading institution of its kind in Latin America, precisely the time that the Sao Paulo Biennale made the city the most important center for contemporary art on the continent. The museum was conceived in very different conditions from those in which it was finally realized. From 1964 to 1985, Brazil was governed by a military dictatorship, to which Bobardi was firmly opposed. Although less murderous than its counterparts in Chile and above all neighboring Argentina, the return to dictatorship after 19 years of democracy was a clear step backwards, and it almost certainly slowed the construction of a building in which Bobardi quite consciously attempted to create a viable public sphere. The main body of the building is its most dramatic feature. Designed to create a large plaza underneath and to both sides of its long facades, it is now furthermore painted red, which was not, however, the original con color. Painting a building like this red in 1968 in Brazil was simply inconceivable politically. The engineering of the clear span is one of the things that endears Bobardi to many people. This is clearly bold architecture on a far from domestic scale. It was also radically removed from the mainstream of modern Brazilian architecture as epitomized by the contemporary design of Brasilia, many of whose major buildings are much more overtly sensual. So it's the male architect having the curving, organic, sensual forms, the female architect giving you the big, bold engineering. Bobardi, who traveled back and forth to Europe several times after moving to Brazil and who continued to keep in touch, not least through reading the major Italian magazines uh, with trends there, was much less interested in representing Brazil at this point than Niemeyer had been, and much more in simply reconceptualizing the art museum. At the same time, one needs to know that Polistas, as the inhabitants of Sao Paulo are called, prided and continue to pride themselves on not following the trends set in rival Rio de Janeiro, which is where Niemeyer was based. There was thus considerable scope for Bobardi, even without the advantage of being commissioned by her husband, to set out in a distinctly different direction. The street view of the building, which faces a major boulevard, is only part of the story, however. Behind it, the building deep, digs deep into the site. Here, the architecture rather resembles a below-grade version of the Newman building, albeit with hanging gardens attached. Much less attention has historically been paid to illustrating the full complexity of this structure, which reminds us of how much we rely on representation in understanding buildings we are less likely to visit. Uh, although, I have been here myself, and I very much recommend going. I haven't been to the other buildings I'm showing you today, uh, except for the the Drew buildings in, in Chandigarh. Uh, the existence of two distinct parts of the building uh, also entails two very different kinds of interiors. On the right, you see the central atrium of the lower part of the building. One enters through here, uh, through this lower part. The various service functions, including offices, are grouped around this space. Such large <coughs> public spaces were very unusual in new museum buildings at the time. This is 1968. They were generally reviewed, uh, reviewed as inappropriately unfunctional holdovers from the historic eclecticism of the previous century, which, of course, in museum architecture, are taking you right up into uh, the, pre the end of the pre-war period. The situation would change in the global north, above all through the work I. M. Pei did for the National Gallery in Washington, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and the Louvre in Paris. And Bobardi's vision of a protected urban space was thus very unusual at the time, but also prescient. 
Even more unprecedented was the one vast gallery in which the museum's major paintings were placed. Remember that this was and remains the best old master European painting collection on view in South America, one that Pietro Bardi largely assembled with the largesse of Brazilian donors. Instead of hanging the, build, the paintings on walls, Bardi lined them up in rows and placed them in holders she designed herself. The staging was unprecedented. Although not necessarily stripped of frames, the arrangement certainly emphasized an abstract distance from the context into which they had originally been set that encouraged viewers to focus on their formal qualities. And of course, remember that all of these paintings are being exhibited in an entirely different cultural context from the one in which, uh, for which they were created. Uh, you're uh, an ocean away, uh, as well as centuries and building types away. And Bobardi's original installation was eventually and very controversially replaced, but it has recently been reinstalled. Bobardi's museum merits comparison with uh, a European museum also designed by an emigre, which was conceived after but completed before Mass. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe's National Gallery in Berlin, which some of you may have visited, also featured a dramatically engineered pavilion. Also free of internal supports and placed on a plinth, its inaugural exhibit of de Stiel work featured paintings hung on wires uh, from the ceiling. In fact, the entrance pavilion proved unsuitable for most exhibits of paintings, uh, which did not much matter as there were ample galleries located in the basement, some of which faced out onto a sculpture court carved into the side of the plinth. From the day it opened, Mises building was, was one of the most celebrated of its time. Located in West Berlin's Cultural Forum, a major Cold War battleground hard up against the Berlin Wall, and designed by a heroic figure who was too frail to travel to its opening, he died the next year, its reception was in many ways the polar opposite of Masks. Although Masks' importance was recognized in Brazil from the beginning, it would take until the end of the Brazilian dictatorship followed by the publication of Bobardi's work in English after her death, to put it on an international map, where, however, it has been now for more than two decades. Bobardi's work, early work in Brazil emerged out of opportunities afforded her by her husband, and through her familiarity with the latest architectural ideas emanating above all from Europe, but also the United States. In 1959, however, she moved for five years from Sao Paulo, the most industrialized city in South America, to Salvador in the Brazilian state of Bahia. The first part of Bahia, uh, of Brazil, excuse me, to be extensively colonized by the Portuguese, Bahia was a center of sugar, cotton, coffee, and tobacco production, all of which were originally dependent on slave labor imported from Africa. In the 20th century, its agrarian economy lagged far behind that of Sao Paulo and Rio, which were far more modern technologically. During her years in Salvador, Bobardi was the founding director of its Museum of Modern Art, which you see here. It reopened in 1966 in quarters it designed for it. She designed for it in a 17th century sugar mill. Bobardi's experience of this very different aspect of Brazil transformed her. Even before Robert Venturi designed his famous house for his mother, she was willing to work sympathetically within a historical context without ever, however, moving from adaptive reuse to postmodern imitation of historical form. In Bahia, she not only learned to work with history, but also to address the vernacular, and in particular, to appreciate the craft imagination of local artisans, many of them untrained, that uh, is, uh, and trained in the formal sense, that is to understand the value of folk art, which was something quite different from the European old master paintings that her husband was importing for Masque. It was at this point that Bobardi began to address the full complexity, I think, of her adopted country in ways that also pushed her to be far more original than she had, pre that had previously been the case and that separated her even more from other metropolitan Brazilian architects as well as her European contemporaries, but which would be appreciated by those who began to discover her in the 1970s in the context of both critical regionalism and sustainability. There was also a strong racial dimension to this. Bardi, of course, was white. 70% of Italian immigrants to Brazil went, like her, to Sao Paulo State, although, of course, few of them immediately belonged, as she did, to its cultural elite. 
In the late 19th and throughout the first three decades of the 20th century, Brazil attracted significant numbers of immigrants from Europe, as well as the Middle East and East Asia. It has a very large Japanese population. Because its economy was exp not expanding, few of these went to Bahia, which remained in consequence much blacker than the rest of Brazil. The northern part of the country is closer to Africa, after all, than any other part of the American landmass. The collage between old and new and between modern and natural materials that you see in her insertions into the middle of the historic sugar mill would also inform what is in many ways Fobardi's masterpiece, not least because it was a better building of not because it was a better building than the glass house or mass, but because it was so distinctively hers and would also be understood as equally, particularly, peculiarly Brazilian. The Pompeo, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing this wrong, I have no Portuguese, factory leisure center opened in 1982, four years before the dictatorship Bobardi had resolutely opposed finally ended. Her conversion of a former steel barrel factory into a social and cultural center that includes a library, exhibition spaces, workshops, a theater, and other facilities presaged the kind of society a democratic Brazil might become. In the 1980s, Brazil and South Africa had the most inequitable wealth distributions of any countries in the world. They're still pretty bad. This, um, and this is also one reason that they're both so violent, I'm sure. In Salvador, Bobardi had worked to bring the region's African and folk heritage into dialogue with both historic architecture and modernist aesthetics. Here, back in Sao Paulo, she married an awareness of the goals of British and French architects committed to engaging the audience for culture through creating new kinds of open plan spaces with an engagement with the working class that was missing in her earlier buildings for mass, but also really missing as well in uh, the Centre Pompidou in Paris. Mass was located amongst the major office towers of the period. This building, on the other hand, was necessarily an industrial area that spilled over into formal and informal housing for those formerly employed at this factory and others like it. At Mass, she had anticipated the direction that Cedric Price would take in his Fun City project for Joan Littlewood and that Renzo Piano and Richard Rogers would adopt in their designs for the Centre Pompidou which was originally envisioned as much more of a community center than a Museum of Modern Art. The Museum of Modern Art was just the top floor of it when I first visited. The combination of vernacular factory sheds with the tough concrete parts of the factory complex gave her the opportunity to work in relationship as well to brutalism, whose uh, robustness, very unusually, she was able to infuse with a dynamic sense of popular occupation. In particular, the unusual window of it she cut into the existing walls jazzed it up to be less overbearing. This ability to cross between the avant-garde and the popular is what made Bobardi so appealing once she was finally discovered by an international audience, really only after her death. It was also what redeemed her from having built her career in Brazil upon being married to one of fascist Italy's leading intellectual defenders. Bobardi was also one of the first to address the issue of what to do with outmoded industrial facilities. The modern movement was predicated in part on the idea that industrial aesthetic represented the spirit of a new age. But by the 1970s, industry was in decline in many former centers of the Industrial Revolution, as rust-built communities from the English Midlands and the German Roar to Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and Detroit in the, American, uh, in the United States all began to lose jobs and with them wealth and population. Adapting factories to serve as cultural infrastructure, just think of the Tate Modern, has become a cliche, but Bobardi was one of the very first to do it. And she took it on in a particularly unfriendly political climate, one which was certainly not focused on empowering the working class that she sought here to serve. The many insertions she made range from the programmatic, a library and a theater, to lighting, a water feature, and what is basically an indoor campfire that brought the space to light in a way that remained entirely removed from the postmodern emphasis on commercialism and spectacle that was an increasingly prominent part of inter international architectural culture in the 1980s. Bobardi's countless interventions brought the complex to light. After more than 35 years, it remains a vibrant hub, as well as in recent decades, increasingly a tourist attraction for internationally uh, architects. 
Finally, Obardi's willingness to work with existing buildings and with local and recycled materials has also made her a patron saint of sustainable architecture, although she never practiced it exactly uh, herself. Jane Drew and Lena Bobardi were two of the world's most successful women architects from the 1950s through, in Bobardi's case, to the 1980s. They built on a large scale and in ways that mattered enormously to the communities as well as the architecture cultures of the countries in which they worked. Both benefited from being married to powerful older men, but only seldom played a background role. Both also benefited even more, I think, from the unequal power relations in the societies in which they worked, that is, from the cultural capital that their European, and it should be said their white identities, brought them in non-European contexts, whether imperial, post-colonial, or simply global Southern. But to be fair, both also used architecture and their own privileged positions within it to create new opportunities for the clients they served. I've taught Jane Drew since 1991. She was never forgotten. Nonetheless, her star has certainly been on the ascendant in recent years, not least through this naming of the architecture prize for her. I think she is perhaps still too much appreciated simply for having been a successful woman architect, rather than for the details of her achievement, which are not as easily slotted into the architect an architectural history that focuses on the avant-garde of those of her much younger uh, counterpart, Alison Smithson. More ordinary modernisms and their enthusiastic reception in the Global South still play second fiddle to the study of those post-war architects based in Europe and the English-speaking world who aspired in ways that Drew did not to be thought leaders, as we would put it today, something she achieved without writing very much about it. Yet ultimately, her close ties to, the British, to British colonial officials and to British business hinder an appreciation of her pioneering contribution to Chandigarh being seen solely in the politically progressive context of India's eventual independence. Bobardi burst onto the international scene in the 1990s, uh, really after her death when a major exhibition was organized, uh, probably with her husband's participation and a catalog was published in English. Being female, being based in Brazil during its dictatorship, and being married to a leading fascist all impeded her international recognition. Even as together, these same conditions also provided opportunities and pushed her in increasingly original directions. Above all this, and I, and I hadn't heard of her when I started teaching in 1991, but a friend came back from somewhere in South America with one of, colleague with one of these catalogs, uh, Sandra Vavanka, gave it to me, said, you should be teaching her, and within a few weeks I was. And that would have been about 85 or 86, when I went down to Brazil for myself in 87 or 88, uh, it was. Um, I went to Sao Paulo, and um, somebody who's working with my cousin picked me up with, from my hotel. And he said, well, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, I've come to see the work of Lena Bobardi, I, I, thinking that he would never have heard of her. Oh, gee, he said, he was a graphic designer. My cat is named Lena. Uh, <laughs> but the number of people I knew in the States at that point who'd heard of her, besides the students I've taught, could be counted on one, one hand. Um, above all, the success of both women is rooted in the conditions that produced Denise Scott Brown and Zaha Hadid, the two architects to whom I will devote my final lecture in this series. The Global South used modern architecture to stake its claims to modernity. It's very geographic distance from the form makers who had given birth to modernism in Europe and the United States created opportunities for those women who could build, opportunities that I should note were often created by other women, although that's beyond the scope of today's lecture. We'll see some of that next time. The results, almost always inflected by local circumstances involving taste as well as technology and climate, were more particular to their place than is usually acknowledged, although certainly Fry and Drew used the same techniques in Ghana, Nigeria, and India, which are not culturally the same. Some were relatively ordinary as modernism became normalized to a deeper degree in the global south than in the countries that had given birth to it. But as both Bobardi and Niemeyer's careers also demonstrate, at other times local conditions also pushed it in very original directions that continue to matter today. Thank you.